Welcome back. I'm a little verklempt. We always record these openers after we actually record the episode, and boo, I had a moment there at the very end. Yeah. Ooh, while you you're did. yawning as you I'm did. thinking about this. <laughs> <You did. laughs> it's like, it's like, it's, it's going to be a snoozer here, folks. Get excited. <laughs> no. no, it was actually an awesome podcast. Guys, come on in. We're talking about aspirations, dreams, desires, what to do with them, and how the enemy really wants to kind of like blind us from them. Yeah, folks, if, if you want to experience the love of the Father, you have to be a child that asks for the good gifts that are on your heart, right? And the Father gives good gifts to his children who ask. We read in Scripture, but there are things that get in the way of our asking. We want to tackle those things and help you to give uh, help you with some strategies to uh, to overcome those things, so that you can be that child that tastes and sees that the Lord is good and experiences the good gifts of the Father that wants to shower you with those. We'll see you in there. Stick around. Hey, welcome back to the Catholic Coaching Podcast. My name is Matt. I'm Erin and Matt. Cool shirt. Hey, thank you. This is Catholic Forge. How do you spell it? It's just Catholic and then Forge, (laughs) F-O-R-G-E. They've got some really cool stuff over here. Some This is a little plug. All right, I'm given. Wait, wait, wait. Look at this. It's the Sacred Heart of Jesus. They're Sacred Hearts. That's so cool. I've I've got another one that's Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's got the the star tilma pattern, uh, which is beautiful, I think. Uh, very mas- masculine, a masculine <laughs> beauty. It actually, yes, it is. It actually looks very masculine. Yeah, but I wear you. this. I wear this in mass and Ave Maria, and I get little compliments on it. So I want to plug them. Uh, I'm really stoked with the work that they're doing. They just want to make some manly apparel for Catholic men. And if you like the Hawaiian shirt style Catholic, uh, mm-hmm. I like it. It's and so uh, check it out. But if you want to go and get 10 percent off at Catholic Forge on your next purchase of a cool shirt like this. Go to Catholic Forge, but check it out in Metanoia 10. Metanoia 10 gets you 10% off. So check it Ooh, out. Ooh, cool. savings. What are we talking about today? We weren't expecting that today. We're talking about our point of awareness for uh, the aspirations. For We're still in our, actually, we're in our fifth point of awareness for the unique mission. Yes. Unique mission, guys. Remember, it's all about what is my purpose? Unique design. Who am I? Unique mission. What's my purpose? Unique battle. What's getting in the way? We have our five points of awareness that we explore in our Metanoia Catholic Academy. Academy Plus. Go check that out. And uh, today, the aspirations. I love this one. I'm really excited about this. This is fun. This is actually, you know, I was was thinking about this the other day, and this is where we started in coaching. Yeah. Like in receiving coaching. It was kind of like, you know, What's that dream muscle? What is that? What What have you always wanted to do? Mm-hmm. Um, and and really kind of working on that atrophied dream muscle that we've that most of us haven't used since we were like eleven. If we're you know adults, so yeah, we're going to be talking about aspirations. What are these dreams? These ideals? These these things that we've always wanted to do? Yeah, these ideals that we want to pursue, but not just pursue, but like make visible here in uh, on Earth, and so. Uh, we, we we choose this as a point of awareness because like interests, they're unique. They seem to be unique. Yes. And it really is aligned with John Paul II's personalism. All right. So we look at that personalistic norm. John Paul II says that, that whenever we're approaching the person, we always have to consider that they have or at least should have their own personal end in mind. Okay. What does this mean? They have their own goal in mind. And that, that goal John Paul II says we want to hold space for the and reverence that goal mm. as something that really has a, a divine origin. Yes, we have a way of taking these beautiful desires that God's placed in our hearts and twisting them and trying to fulfill them in all mm-hmm. kinds of disordered ways. But at their core, that desire in our hearts is there to bring us to a place of contemplation of God, draw us into a deeper relationship. And so it's important to be able to look and hold space for these aspirations, but also at the same time, realize the reality of a fallen world yeah. and how these things can be corrupted. But that's not the end of the story. Yeah. Remember, redemption has happened and we can claim that too. And that can, that can roll over into these aspirations. Yeah. I think this is such um, a what is this, point of awareness. Okay. This is such a coaching point of awareness yeah. because that's really what we're called to be as coaches is this witness of hope 
and and this looking forward into the future. Because mm-hmm. so often we can kind of stay stuck in the past, and then when we're stuck in the past, we recreate the past, unfortunately, mm-hmm. right? Like we keep thinking those same thoughts, we stay in that same emotional space, and we keep recreating what we don't want to create. And so for us to actually be able to look forward and dream alongside of God, I like how you were saying like, yes, these there's desires that also need to be redeemed Mm -hmm. here, but also to surrender those desires to God. I think that is such a huge piece of this. Yeah. And and it's it's so important here, folks. And and this is one of the things that comes up in coaching a lot of times is when we start to help our clients to exercise as dream muscle, stretch this aspiration muscle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the, where they start is these dreams that they think they should have, yeah. right? They should have these dreams and they start to, to kind of take somebody else's ideal or something that's not really theirs mm-hmm. and, and co-opt it. Now, that's not a terrible place to start as long as we are being students of our own resonance as we're exploring that. I, I think a great example is really where we started, Aaron. Yeah. I mean, I, I still remember the pictures of a storyboard and we had this, we had this uh, aspiration that we chose in the beginning before Metanoia Catholic on how we were going to have a podcast series that was all about helping to raise awareness for Creighton practitioner and fertility care model. Mm-hmm. Just That was part of our story. We struggled to get pregnant, and we, we realized that there really was a poverty of people understanding these other options for, for having kids and conceiving, and, and that were really aligned with our church and very dignifying and, mm-hmm. and drew the couple into a deeper relationship as a result of, of, of following those things. And, and so we really set out for this podcast and man, yeah. like we got into it. We started inter- interviewing people Yes, and there was a point where like, it was like a beautiful mind in our basement where we <laughs> just had the sticky notes all over the place of piecing this all together. And then one day, Aaron, you just came, kind of came out and you came up to me and you were like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the I don't want to do this. Uh, the funny thing is when we started our coaching program, we, we wrote out those cards. Yeah. Right. Like, and it was like, I, whatever it was like, whatever your dream is. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I had two dreams on my card, even though you're only supposed to have one, I had two, but one was to own a Catholic production company one day mm-hmm. and that produced like awesome films on saints. Such a cool, such a cool idea. It, so cool. Had no desire to produce any film Mm -hmm. at all but like i just want to be kind of on the think tank (laughs) so i'm like maybe one day when i become like a bajillionaire i could just see my aspiration muscle right there um i could just like own one and be like hey maybe you should do this thing and like that's that is like (laughs) the extent of how i want to be involved in that this is the ideation the other the other part is um the other uh goal that i wrote on that was i want to coach catholics Cool. And, and so when we kind of landed on this thing and it was very much a should goal, mm-hmm. like this is hey, noble, this is needed. Yes, and you need. should yeah. be grateful for what NAPRO did. And, and we are incredibly grateful, but it was, it was, um, it was a little bit of that should behind it. Mm-hmm. And when we just kept, when we were really committed to it, there came a point where it was just like, this isn't what I want to do. Yeah. And like, and. <laughs> And that's like such an Period. important, yeah, <laughs> not into this. I remember, Aaron, you were just like, no, I'm not even interested in like kind of being convinced because like the achiever in me was just like, well, we already did all this work and we've gone on this path and we talked to all these people. What are we just going to do? Not talk to them again, which is exactly what we did. Yes. We didn't call anybody and be like, oh, sorry, so sorry. It was just like, what happened to those people? And it's like, oh, well, they just moved on with their lives yeah. but, and they, and, we, and just disengaged. But I'm, I, I get it. Even just but it's so important, folks, to just continue when we start these goals, and and the Lord used that yeah. to to just continuing to be a a student of what it's like going through and pursuing those things. I remember when I was in college, and I had really been kind of mapping out my future based on what my father had done, done. Mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know he went to the Naval Academy, I went to the Naval Academy, and he uh, became a Navy pilot. And that was always the thought that I have is I'm going to be a Navy pilot. And there were other people that uh, were in my life at that time that were just like, yeah, the Navy pilot's the way to go. And when I started to pursue that, and I remember the first time I went up in a plane, I was just like, I hate this. But I was like, but I'm not allowed to hate this because I'm going to be a Navy pilot. And mm. everybody else is like high five and they're excited about this. But I absolutely couldn't stand being strapped into that freaking thing <laughs> and having the mask on and getting sick. I just, it, it was just terrible. And, 
And I remember the moment where I was with some buddies and I was finally, we we're on a jog and I remember just sharing like, Hey, I, I think I want to be a Marine. And there was another guy that was on the run with me, my buddy Ford. And he was like, yeah, I want to be a Marine too. And like, that was really a turning point where we both voiced that desire kind of like you did, Aaron. And we just started to kind of move towards that new aspiration. Yeah. Which had a much deeper resonance. And I think what's interesting is we both understood what we didn't want, which I think is, we don't talk about this in this podcast, but I think that's an interesting point. Like knowing what you want also determines what you don't want, you know, like knowing what you don't want. So what happens when you don't grow in this area, (laughs) this awareness? I I, I say one of the symptoms that you really show is, is, Frankly, it's it's depression, and I remember mm. I remember Victor Frankel, man yes. search for meaning, talks about the neurotic tribe, and the depression being one of those things. And gosh, there is a there is an epidemic de- of depression that we see here, and mm-hmm. I'm not saying that this is the sole reason behind it, but I mean what Victor Frankel would say is like, hey, if you're not doing what you're meant to be doing, then it's kind of ordered to feel depressed with mm. that. And I think part of that is is depression, but there's also a disappointment with your own life that's yeah. there. And so if you find yourself having that disappointment, let's not be afraid of that. Let's just mean like disappointment. All it does is it reveals that there's an ideal that you have in your head. Maybe it's unspoken. Maybe it's an, mm-hmm. maybe it's, it's an unconscious ideal. I mean, these ideals are, are really something that have a, di- a divine origin that we need to come to know and discover through kind of the things that we like and we don't like. Yeah. That's kind of what we're helping people on that journey at Metanoia Catholic. But, but that it, that's a symptom, I would say, of not really leaning into your aspirations is mm-hmm. feeling that disappointment. And because whether you are conscious of the desire, the aspiration or not, mm-hmm. it's still there. It's part of who you are. It's part of this divine word that's been spoken to you and you alone. And you are called to make that word visible. And until you make that word visible here on earth, which is going to take God's grace, which is mm-hmm. going to take his a, a relationship with the Lord to do that there's going to be that longing and that's still there. Yeah. Like tremendous longing that's still there. And it's there to get us to go introspective, to kind of get curious, not to judge and to hide from that disappointment, but but to lean into it a little bit and Mm -hmm. see what it's revealing to us. Yeah. I also think you have this written down here, but disengagement from your own life. Absolutely. But I also think that shows up differently for each temperament. Tell so me. disengagement might be what a choleric would think. Like I feel disengaged from my life or I feel like I'm not making an impact maybe. And I'm not doing what I was meant to do. That's right. Mm-hmm. And I think for um, a sanguine, it might be like my life isn't exciting. It's boring. Okay. Like that, that's that disengagement. Maybe for the melancholic, it's like my life lacks meaning. Mm-hmm. Like there's mm-hmm. just this lack of mean, like this lack of meaning in their life or purpose mm-hmm. in their life. And then for the phlegmatic, I think there's just like a lack of conviction, like something that kind of gets me to move, mm-hmm. gets me out of my comfort, even though I love comfort and balance, yep. it gets me out of it a little bit, baby steps, right? Yep. Yep. So depending on what temperament you are or whatever word just applied to you here, um, consider that if you're feeling any of those things, this might be a way to actually yeah counter those emotions well, yeah, at le- yeah at least get into it because when you start to really lean into your aspirations and exercise that dream muscle lean into these things a little bit more get in touch with those desires even though they are guys when you start to move into these things they're going to be tainted they're going to have some vainglory built in we're going to get into that here yeah. in a moment just expect it to be there and that's just okay because god guess what you need a redeemer that's all it means you Yay. need a redeemer hooray and you don't have to do all the work yourself but when you start leaning into it, there really is this joy mm. and an excitement yes. and a hope, a hope when you have something that you're aspiring towards, you get up in the morning and it's not so duty bound. It's not, I think without the aspirations, it's very easy to like, okay, I'm getting up, yes. I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I got to take care of my kids, I got to get the job done, I got to b- bring home the bacon, I got to do the chores and it just, life becomes very duty bound that's there. Yeah, obligatory. It, obligatory thank yes. you which which whenever there's obligation there's a lack of freedom and whenever there's a lack of freedom don't be surprised when you see a little bit of resentment and rebellion yeah. showing up there as well so how do we get a little bit more engaged with this well i yeah well you All feel right. more engaged Sorry. with the obligation piece i just want to pause on that Go it's for not it. whenever there's obligation but obligation if we haven't chosen it yeah. yes there is a, lot, a lack of freedom Go ahead. Okay, you're going to start to feel a lot more engaged with your life. And based on your temperament, what that means, kind of what Aaron said, 
shows find up more meaning. You're getting, you're doing what you're meant to do. You're having more excitement in your life. You're having more conviction. Maybe some deeper relationships here as well. Uh, and then also you start. I find that you start measuring your life not by what you haven't done yet and the mm. big gap, but more towards the gain. There's a lot more celebration of the wins, the daily wins, the small wins that keep you engaged, that keep yeah. you excited, that keep you moving forward and uh, and just keep you hopeful. Hope. And it has an effect yes. on everybody is, else around you. Hope is the big, the big, um, yeah, gift here. Which I, I'd, say, I'd say hope. Yes, it's yes. Piece. And we've even built this into our academy. At the end, so the academy is set up, folks, where every month it's a 30-day journey. We, we know the science shows that 26 days roughly to, to change a habit, to build a new habit, a new, a new, even either an, a new hard skill, a new hard skill habit, but just even dedicating focused effort for 30 days towards a soft skill. Maybe it's growing in patience or growing in humility or some sort of a virtue there is a real effect that happens and at the end of the month we're always celebrating those wins we have the live win call Mm -hmm. in academy plus which is really just looking back and celebrating those gains it builds such a culture that has a momentum that keeps you and seeking out that next win every single month Mm. yeah cool agreed (laughs) <laughs> Let's, we're going to get into the uh, the meat of the podcast here, which is kind of bringing in that battle element. So recognizing that the more you grow aware of this point of awareness, your aspirations, you're going to get more. Uh, you're going to get more in touch with your unique calling, your unique mission. All right, what you're called to do, what your purpose is. All right. So the devil wants to keep us from even growing aware of these points of awareness because. To the extent that we don't know these things, we're going to be disengaged and feel all those, all yeah. those depression and you know disappointment stuff like that. So, yeah. which is right where he wants us to be. So let's get into some of these lies. We got three lies here. The first lie, and this comes up a lot, and it comes up in Catholics. All right, is my dreams are vain. Mm-hmm. My dreams are vain. All right, a little bit of vainglory that's in there. Have you ever felt this before? Mm-hmm. Like ah man, I. I want to have the big house. Okay, that's obviously vain because it's d- desiring something material. Okay, I want to have the Maserati. Obviously vain. I want to have the material. I want to have the beautiful $2,000 portrait of our Blessed Mother. I, ugh, is that vain? Suddenly now, all of a sudden, there's kind of this shift. And I think that, and, or there's, there's a pause here. I mean, I think of even, even our church at, at Ave Maria, it has this huge marble mural of the annunciation on the front mm-hmm. i think that was like some 15 like or well, eight, eight million dollars or something like their that. their tabernacle costs a lot too yeah i it's, mean like millions of dollars are being poured into these things yeah. and so so and these are material things yes are they drawing us into a, a greater contemplation yes does mm-hmm. the tabernacle have a, a greater objective capacity arguably to draw somebody into greater contemplation than a maserati does arguably yes but subjectively i don't know Mm-hmm. I don't know. Somebody may need to have that Maserati experience to experience what it's like to be the old, like the, the son in living in the abundance of the father, right? So Lest he may fall into the, the same trap that the older son does in the prodigal son. So you're saying, how do we find out? How do we find out if somebody is, is like, what, how do we find out the subjective side of it? Well, yeah, I, I think this, this, this thought, first of all, this thought that my, my dreams are vain, what it does is it brings about an emotion of shame. Mm-hmm. And then in that place, the shame, we just hide our dreams, we hide our aspirations, and we don't look at them, mm. and we discard all of it, right? We throw the baby out in the bathwater, and again, we're operating from the premise that at the core of these desires, there's something div- of divine origin that is calling us, mm. calling us through this through this material good, through the beauty of the Maserati, or at the power of the Maserati, or even the beauty of, or like the, the secondary good of the mm-hmm. fame, or the honor or the pleasure that it brings there's something that is that is inviting us to that now if we just land at the maserati and we think that's going to be the primary good we're going to be mistaken but sometimes god uses that i mean i think even tom monahan he tells his own story tom monahan founder of domino's pizza started like multi multi million millionaire started this beautiful community at ave maria like he tells a story about having the the garage full of all the classic cars and owning the, the Detroit Tigers and owning the baseball mm-hmm. team and, and taking them to a championship. And, and, and he tells that that's part of his conversion. God used that as part of his conversion experience of kind of, I mm-hmm. thought these were going to be the things that sat aside. And he knows on a very visceral level that they didn't. 
And so that the Lord can still use those things. Yeah. And I would say start with the desires that you know. Yes. Presuming that they are moral, right? That they're objectively moral. Or okay, or at the root things. of them is yes. moral. So yeah, okay. Like a so, Maserati is not immoral. I, I think I think the problem it. here is just this this misunderstanding. Is that is that a word? Yeah. It misunderstanding is. of desire. Of like here's another thing too. When you push down desire, it will find a way up. It mm-hmm. always does. It's yeah. like that beach ball that you push underwater. It finds a way up and it usually comes out in a more destructive way. Right. So when we're trying to like push it down, push it down, push it down, let's say you have this desire for a big house or something like that and you immediately judge it. And even though you might have a big family, who needs a big house? I don't know. But you immediately judge it. And then that that desire comes out in another way or out of frustration. Guys, desire is an emotion. It's emotional fuel and has a tremendous amount of power. It does. And Mm -hmm. so it actually would behoove us to bring that to the Lord and say, Lord, what is this desire all about? Because I know what my desire is at the core of it. You are there. I know that at the core of every desire I have, you are there. But I've tried to fix it on my own. I've tried to fill it on my own. And it's led to sin. It's led to vice. It's led, it's led me away from you. Who You, who are the fulfillment of all my desires. Yeah, I, I think a really good parable backdrop for this one is prodigal son. I think it's a great one. And and we can see that like both both the older son and the younger son both had desires. They both had desires. Mm. The younger son wanted to act on those desires, but he wanted to do it outside of a relationship with the father, right? The mm. older son denied his desires, mm. and and that took him from a, a relationship with the son to the point where he from the, with the father to the point where he couldn't even go in and enjoy the banquet at the end of the story, and so and so what does it look like? What is a virtuous embracing of these desires? All right, mm. I mean, imagine if if the younger son went to his father and said, "Father." I have these burning desires in me to, you know, and all of them and just share them with the father and also said, and I, I know that you're good and I trust you and I want to, I want to, I don't want to lose the relationship with you, but I still have these burning desires. What an incredible prayer. Can you imagine if like, that's how we prayed to God and just shared those things, but at the same time, knowing that there, they, we may need some help. There may be some weeds amongst the wheat, or or something that's mixed in there that's not that's yeah. not necessarily pure and holy. But at the same time, it's like I want to share those with the Father, anyways, because the Father can still He's got the ability to purify those things, right. and He wants to give me those things. He's a and Father that gives good gifts. He's also not shocked by them. Like He's not like. <gasps> <laughs> this is such a surprise, Matthew. Like, what? Right. I didn't see this coming. <laughs> He's not shocked by them. So, like, it, yeah. It's like, hold a little space for our wounded humanity. That's yes, what I want to please. do here, folks. Like, we, yes, I, I know that even when it, with, with some of the pursuits that we have at Metanoia Catholic, sometimes, even if we're launching a new program, mm-hmm. I know that there's this, this desire for the security, the financial security that comes from the success of that new product launch mm-hmm. that we have. Mm-hmm. Okay. I also recognize and have this desire to, to help people through that new product and help them to come to know their unique design, mission, and battle, mm-hmm. and, and all of those things, and engage these things, and engage their best life. And so there's, I, I know this, and this is my work to do, folks, and I, I say, and the, I've also experienced constantly bringing mm-hmm. this to the Lord, a real, a real purification. That is not something that I've been able to muster up myself, yeah. but through a constant surrendering, Lord, I know that this is here. I see this. I recognize this. All of a, I mm-hmm. didn't see it before, but all of a sudden this situation just happened and I, I realize how, how I do have this attachment to the financial security and I want to be able to do it without you and, and I have this pride here. Lord, I repent. Yes. Help me with these things. And you know what, folks? Like That is... That is actually the way, a contrite heart. That is that is the sacrifice that the Lord wants laying on. We read this in Psalm 51. Yeah. Not bowls and bullocks and burnt offerings, but a contrite heart is what the Lord is looking for. And when we can really be honest with our desires, even in their taintedness, the Lord works with that. He's not afraid of with it. He wants to redeem it. He does. Yeah. yeah. So what's the strategy, Matt? I, I think first of all, it's just just get clear on where you have these mixed desires that are there. Yeah. Where you where you desire the secondary good. Now the secondary good is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Fame, honor, wealth, uh, uh, 
pleasure. Pleasure. Aquinas talks about these things. They're not evil. There's a reason why they call them goods. <laughs> they're, they're good, right? He call, But in their proper place. Yes. Okay, so it's doing the work to recognize, all right, Lord, reveal to me, and not to get scrupulous with it, mm-hmm. but Lord, reveal to me, I'm trusting that you are going to do the work to reveal to me, or Blessed Mother, you, you reveal all whose heart mm-hmm. of sword, or, or, a heart of sword is pure so that the thoughts of many may be revealed. Blessed Mother, reveal to me these hidden thoughts of, you know, where I am aspiring towards these secondary goods as the end, as my greatest good. Reveal that to me so that I might repent and invite in that transformative power of God. And it's the only thing that's really going to be able to reorient these things for God's glory alone. I'm going to make it practical. Do it. So when you find out what secondary good you may be attached to, which we're all attached to one of them, Mm -hmm. like, and and it was making me think of the predominant fault, right? Like, we all have a predominant fault. So first of all, you have to become aware of that. But when you identify which of these secondary goods you're attached to, um, journal on this and allow and ask the Lord to reveal this to you. But ask yourself in the journal, what am I afraid or concerned will happen if this were to be taken away? Mm-hmm. And that's how you start to reveal those thoughts underneath. Mm-hmm. And you can take those thoughts through the reason cycle. And if you're not a part of our academy, come on in. We have coaches who help you with that. So, all right. Enemy strategy number two. Okay. What's the lie? I want to be realistic. So when they're thinking about their aspirations, how many of you, raise your hand, (laughs) even if I can't see you, but how many of you think, yeah, but these aren't realistic. I can't even tell you how many times I've coached people and immediately they will have this realistic police mm-hmm. kind of come in mm-hmm. and be like, yeah, 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 but I can't do that. And I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're just playing for a second. Like, mm-hmm. let's just for five minutes practice dreaming without the real, the realistic police coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And just, and just, and, and what we're getting at here too is do you want your goals to be realistic? Yeah. I think yeah. that's, an, I think that's important. Like to, to pursue something that's not that's completely unrealistic is not humble. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, it, there's, it's Aquinas would say, I was looking up humility. I was doing a lot of research on it recently and humility actually falls under the, the virtue of modesty. Right. And so he, he <laughs> says that there's two um, virtues that manage modesty, like kind of, and modesty has to do with the kind of like staying in, in your appropriate place here and recognizing that, there's a hierarchy of of glory. Not all of us are cl- called to the same level of glory. Obviously, the Blessed Mother is way, 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 way above where any of us is ever going to be. Uh, Christ himself, way, way, way above everybody, any, where anybody's going to be, probably St. Ther- St. Teresa of Avila and all these great saints, way above, right? But each one of us has our place. And so a modest approach to our aspirations is going to be going to the place that God has predestined for us, okay? And so that takes both uh, the virtue of humility, which helps us to temper, all right, from going excessive, but also the virtue of enterprise, which which uh, helps to, what's the word he uses? Uh, helps to, to stiffen us, right? Stiffen us and, and move us towards, um, uh, stiffens us against hopelessness, and mm. so it keeps us from going pusillanimous, which is where we just kind of Give up. go we, resignation, right? Mm-hmm. So we're still aspiring towards great things and hopeful things and knowing mm. that eyes not seen, ears not heard, nor is it entered the heart of man what God has planned for those who love him. It's like holding the space for that reality, but at the same time, knowing that not every single one of us is called to be an astronaut, okay? So uh, that's, yes, unrealistic goals are not great goals and Let's not be so quick to say that, like, yeah. all right, Lord, it's it's unrealistic the pursuit. I remember in the beginning we were really encouraged yeah. to pursue those big, hairy, audacious goals, mm-hmm. which I've got some thoughts about. Sometimes that can be helpful. It, it's good at stretching you. It's a great exercise, but also you know that always needs to be tempered with humility, state in life. Yeah, um, yeah, your other, yes. Your other know all that. that. Yep. But I, I also like when I coach people on this. This thought, I just want to be realistic, like. I, I I do ask them what they mean by that mm-hmm. yeah. because usually what they mean, and I remember how I thought this way too. Um, usually what they mean is like, I I don't want to do something that I'm not certain about. Okay. 
I don't, I don't want to do something that's kind of scary and uncertain. And like that, that's really what's underneath what's going on here. Like mm-hmm. I'm always like define realistic because like, here's the thing, my real, my life, my reality right now, if it wasn't for coaching, if it wasn't for people asking me these questions and teaching me how to manage my mind and teaching me how to manage my resilience and, mm-hmm. and kind of dive into this prayer with the Lord and with my desires, if somebody like this wouldn't be realistic either, but it is my reality. Yeah. And it's, it's okay for something not to be realistic today, but that doesn't mean that you know, you, yes. you don't, it's, it's never going to be right. realistic. Right. We get so stuck in our current circumstances yes. and we presume that, okay, we're always going to have the same mm-hmm. income. We're always going to have the same relationships. We're always going to have the same, you know, uh, obligations that we have throughout. Our, and, and things change and a lot of things are within our authority to change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If we just start to engage that. And so we, I think there's people can say unrealistic and they're looking at the current circumstances. Yeah. You're like, and, and it saying, kind of is right here. now, actually with, with the way that your mind is working, it right. is unrealistic. Right. But then we just kind of give up <laughs> at that point. Right. And it's, and I think, and what happens is it really leads to these fruits of hopelessness, mm-hmm. uh, discouragement, and eventually again, this depression, we fall back into some of those symptoms that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what can we do? Here's what I, I would my first practical application for you guys is if you do have this thought, like define realistic, define what it is. And, and even like your state in life, like where are you at? What is realistic for you? Get factual about it though. Don't be like, Oh, I just never have achieved this. Like that's not facts. That's more Mm -hmm. of a perception. Yeah. And things, things can change on a dime here, folks. Mm -hmm. Like it was not realistic for me to leave my full-time job. No. And then and say we're going to pursue Metanoia Catholic full time. Like didn't re- it wasn't realistic in terms of just the obligations of my state in life. I didn't I needed to have some sort of an income to be able to replace what I was doing. And and mm-hmm. and I I never in a million years could have could have known that virtual Catholic conference was going to just explode yeah. like it did and create that space where it was very realistic. But it was it was constantly taking this unrealistic in the moment desire mm. and presenting it to God and being like, Lord, I don't see how this is going to happen, <laughs> but still I'm just presenting, I'm surrendering this desire for, to you. I was doing that. I did that for about seven months. It was yeah. just a daily surrendering of this honest desire, knowing that the, and the Lord was purifying it throughout the way. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. he gave away and it was a way I never could have anticipated in the same way that, you know, when, when Andrew brings the five loaves and the two fish yeah, and he's just like, I don't, I don't know how, what good is this against with, with so many? And the Lord can work with our five five loaves and two fish. So there is the realistic, but also we. It's important that we 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 create a space for God to wow us, for God to surprise us in ways that we we can't even fathom. And we have to we have to collaborate with Him, like Mm -hmm. exactly what you were just saying. You wrote that in your journal every single day. So did I. I wrote in my journal every single day that I wanted to coach train. And teach other Catholic coaches how to coach. Yeah. (laughs) And I did that for a year, a complete like a year until, well, actually I did that for about six months before our first training, but like a couple years until we actually certified and we just certified our 100th coach. Pretty awesome. This this pretty awesome spring. So like we're already halfway sold out with our fall court. Who has that? right Right. Who has that audacity to do that? Like, I just was presenting it to him. I had no idea that this was where it would go. Yeah. Really excited. So with these things, some practical things, guys, is like sometimes having those aspirations, putting together like the practical steps to get there, mm-hmm. that's helpful. But don't be discouraged when the practical steps are beyond your means to really engage those things right now. Just I, I think when you when you start to engage, you can indulge in the how and yes. that can crush yes. the dream muscle. The how is none of your business. And I like saying that. Again, yes. I never knew Virtual Catholic Conference was going to have the success that it was. And you never that was knew be COVID would be there. <laughs> I never knew COVID was going to happen. So you just you just don't know. So even if you have the desire, start with the honest desire and be like, hey, I don't necessarily know how. It's none of our business. Yeah. All right. But just be open to the Lord to reveal these things to us. Mm-hmm. And then answer the question, are you willing to commit? Are you willing to commit? And be honest too. Like, what are the limitations that you're willing to commit? Are you willing to go all in? What does all in look like 
in your given state in life so that you aren't sacrificing the obligations you have to your family yeah. or to your current job or the other commitments that you have here as well. And this one I think is important too. When you commit, are you willing also to commit to have compassion towards yourself mm. where you don't necessarily persevere in a, in a given moment? And, and are you committed to recommit? Yeah to that, to pursuing that and can mm-hmm. continue to offer to the Lord. I think that's like the number one commitment. Are you committed to take those five loaves and two fish and humbly present those to the Lord? Yeah. We begin again today. Yes. Yeah. The future starts today. That's what John Paul II said. Yeah. Put it on a t-shirt. But I, yeah, I'm going to add one more thing. Set aside time to dream. And like, even if you have to put it on your phone, set five minutes and in that, in those moments, you just kind of are like, Lord, what is it? And maybe you answer some of these questions. I'm going to give you a couple of juicy questions to get your brain, your brain going. Do it. But uh, set aside time, five minutes on your on your phone to actually dream. And when you start to think about the how, how Lord, or start to tr- strategize, I have to. I call my coaches out on this all the time. They're always buffering with strategy. strategy. Mm-hmm. But like when you start to strategize, just kind of bring it back to the dream. And you're like, what would that be like if this were my reality? Like, Lord, you know, would you, would you ever give me something like that? Mm. Like that is, he wants to talk to us about that. Yeah. He's a father that gives good gifts to his children who ask. Mm-hmm. Give them to the children who ask. Be a child who asks, folks. Yeah. Cool. So I have one question for you guys to um, just kind of ruminate on. And it's, if you could pioneer a cause around the world and it was guaranteed to be a success, what would it be? Go take that to prayer. Cool. All right. Let's wrap up with our final strategy and our enemy strategy here. And this one comes up a lot. Ooh. Comes up in spiritual direction. Um, and it sounds really pretty, folks. Sounds really pretty. Ready for this sounds one? Sounds very humble. Yes, yes. Very pious. It doesn't matter what I want. It only matters what God wants. <laughs> and it I might mean, be true. Like and, the person might be thinking that for and real. And it is true. Like yes. there <laughs> is kind of like there's, there's, there's a part of that I would say that is true because it is all about what God wants because guess what? What God wants is really at our core what we want to because mm. at our core, it's that desire that he's given to us, okay? So like there's, but we we miss that reality when it's just like dismiss my desires yeah. as yeah. if those don't have any sort of, there's no good evidence to be found there, right? Uh, and then just pursue what God wants as if he didn't communicate his desires through our desires. Well, it, you know, and this is the story of the older son. Yes. You so, didn't even give me a goat. Right, right, right. And it's like, whoa, whoa where did all this resentment come from? You know, like, and it's because he was shoving his desires down. Yep. And he was like, I just want what my father wants. But then like the minute he gets the opportunity to complain <laughs> and hold on and harden his own heart, really. Yes. Yes. I, I think what comes what can come, it doesn't, it's it, test the fruits in yourself. But when this thought, I want what God, like what, it doesn't matter what I want. It only matters what God wants. Mm. When this thought leads to suspicion, a suspicion of yourself, a suspicion mm. of your desires to the point where the, ultimately that suspicion goes to this place of. Toss it out. Tossing, ignoring, exiling, mm-hmm. repressing those desires we're, we're, we're taking the very five loaves and two, fr- two fish and we're, we're throwing those to the side. Mm. And rather than taking those and presenting those as a humble offering to the Lord and being like, work with this, it's, it's like not bringing the bread and wine to the altar and saying to the priest, give us a Eucharist. I love that analogy. Can I add another one? Please. Because yes. this is something I said earlier in this podcast, but... Desire is such, it's an emotion. So it actually fuels our actions towards the thing at that which we love. Yeah. And it's a tremendous amount of power. And when we toss out our desire, we're, we're basically a car with no fuel. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> not moving anywhere. Not it's going not places. going anywhere. And that that kind of leads to that that result that you were saying in the beginning where it's just like this 
this disengagement with your life, but also this disappointment and depression, well, just it, not doing anything, feeling stuck. Yeah, and you're disengaged from the relationship with the father. Yes. I mean, like, think about it, things, folks. When, when you are suspicious of your desires and then you cast them to the side, that's a part of you that you're just hiding at this point. You're mm. not bringing into the relationship. And that is not honest. That brings dishonesty into the relationship. Yeah. That brings a, a, a whitewashed, masked person into the relationship. You're not fully who you are. And that is not like that is not going to feel good. Like you're going to you're mm-hmm. going to feel unseen. And it's not that God is saying get rid of this. He's saying bring it all to me. Yeah, bring it all to me. Bring it all to me. And I mean, he didn't. He ran towards the the younger mm-hmm. son mm-hmm. when he when he saw saw him and he he saw that he was coming back to enter into a relationship with him, even if it was like the younger son didn't even understand the full relationship that he wanted to enter into. He's just like, I'll just be your slave. I'll just be a hired servant mm. working for you. But at least I'll have some relationship with the father and through the, like it wasn't a pure, it wasn't like I want to, I want to return to the father because I just love the father and everything. He's like, no, I want to return to the father. So at least I don't have to eat pig food. Yes. So that I can eat. Wasn't a perfect desire, but he still brought that imperfect desire. And what did God do? He, mm. he gave him, what he he showed him what this is what you truly desire mm. and he revealed it to him and can you imagine what that was like where all of a sudden it was just like that experience of of just taking the mm. that even that broken desire that's still seeking a secondary good of not eating pig food yeah and what god did with it goodness well i this kind of is a full circle moment too because like even just when you're talking about in the beginning my desires are vain and you were talking about like like Tom Monahan or whatever, like the Lord allowed him to like get all of those cars. Yes. To realize that, yeah, this isn't fulfilling. This yes. actually isn't fulfilling me. Yes. And and just like the father from the prodigal son story was like, here's your inheritance. Go like gave it. it to them. And then when, when you come back, I will I will yeah. Yeah. And take he- you back. And he gives it knowing that the son might not come back. I know. Like that is, that is how, how much he gives. He gives and he gives and he gives. Mm. Folks, like the, we have these aspirations. You, you have them. You've got them. We've got them. Mm-hmm. And God, all he wants is for us to share them. And all Satan wants to do is to hide them, to rep- repress them. Because the more we repress them and we stop being children that ask the Father mm-hmm. for good things, if we don't ask, we don't receive. Remember, there's no such thing as a person that doesn't ask and receives. Asking you shall receive. Seeking you shall find. Knocking it shall be open to you. There's no such thing as a person that doesn't ask yet receives because that would mean that God is forcing himself on us. And he doesn't force himself us. He wants us to willingly open to him. Mm. And when we do, even a crack, he flows in. He exploits those gaps in a way that is fully in keeping with our freedom and always honoring us and our dignity and our, and our, and our, and our free will as persons uh, that have their own agency. That's like free to love. That's uh, that, uh, the, the gift that he's given to us. Mm. I, I Kind of to wrap up here, I, I think of a, a, great, a great story. I love the movie Rudy. And when I was reflecting on this this piece here, I, I thought of the story of the part of the movie where Rudy, you know, if you don't familiar with the movie, he's this guy, doesn't have a whole lot of athletic ability. He's small. He's always had this aspiration to, to play football at Notre Dame. And he's from the small Indiana mining town and, or a steel, steel mill town. And he gets, finally gets, something happens in his life. He gets ready to go and he's sitting at the bus stop to go to Notre Dame and his father sits down next to him and his father starts to share this story of how his father had a dream once to be a, a cattle farmer. Mm. And then tragedy stuck, struck and all of those cows that they bought died and then the father took off. And so now this father has this association that dreams are just, they just bring people heartache. That's what he says. Mm. Chasing a stupid dream just brings nothing but you and the people you love heartache. And so we can see that he's desiring to protect his son, but he's also believing this lie. And that moment where Rudy says, I don't want what you want. I don't want what my brothers want. I want to pursue this. And there's a really beautiful healing moment 
Oh, I get choked up thinking, <laughs> thinking about it. Like two beautiful healing moments in this movie where where Rudy first gets into Notre Dame and he brings the, the acceptance letter up to his father and his father looks at him and he goes, you did it. You did it. And then he gets up on the loudspeaker and says, my son's going to Notre Dame. My son's going to Notre Dame. There's just such pride that's there. There's awakening in him. And then what is Rudy? Rudy says, he's, he's like, I, I got to go. I got to get back for tryouts. And all of a sudden, boom, that protector, that 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 part, my son, he wants more. This wasn't enough. He wants more. Mm. And that like that protector part of the of the father shows up again. That wounded, that woundedness.